Welcome to my second video. Uh, in this video we're going to talk about the theory and method behind static trade-off theory. And in the next video we're going to talk about pecking order theory. As a brief reminder, both theories were uh, considered by Myers and by many other uh, in the academic, in the academia, uh, as the heavyweight champions of of uh, uh, corporate finance literature. Now, static trade-off theory on the left side of the ring uh, essentially viewed firms as setting, uh, striving towards some target debt-to-value ratio. Uh, this meant that more leverage, more debt they borrowed, uh, meant that they would get uh, tax shields. They would have to pay less taxes, and so there, there was some balance uh, that would maximize the value of the firm uh, by finding between debt uh, and value. Uh, on the right side of the ring we've got pecking order theory. Uh, this uh, once more is that firms prefer internal financing to external uh, and debt to equity when it must use external financing. Let's go in depth into, in depth into uh, static trade-off theory. Uh, once more, a firm's optimal debt ratio has usually been viewed as determined uh, by a trade-off of costs and benefits of borrowing, holding the firm's assets and uh, investment plan constant. The firm is portrayed as balancing this value of interest tax shield against various of other costs. Uh, for instance, the cost of bankruptcy, because the, the more you borrow, the riskier uh, the more you expose yourself to the risk of uh, going bankrupt because you may not be able to pay back the debt eventually. So uh, what this one of the bottom lines of this theory, however, is that you can pretty much uh, substitute debt for equity until this firm value is maximized. So there's a problem here. Um, and uh, which Myers identifies. There's multiple problems here, which Myers identifies and other people in the literature identifies. Uh, he says there's adjustment costs. So adjustment costs in, uh, in these firms are not considered. Consider there is maybe some large external exogenous shock in the market. Uh, make it so that the firm has far less uh, far less cash flows they're they're not able to pay back debt um, and uh, like if the if this theory if the static trade-off theory uh, were correct and there were no such cost of, ex uh, of adjustment then each firm uh, would be able to instantly adjust this debt to value ratio and it should always be optimal but this is not the case it is precisely because of these adjustment costs, which differ throughout every firm, that uh, we sort of observe why these firms have um, have these little excursions away from this optimal uh, debt to value ratio. It's it's simply not realistic to assume that firms immediately counterbalance the effects of random events. Uh, that bring them away from their optimal level of debt to value. So in doing this, there is one proposition. Uh, well, Meyer says, hey, look, uh, we see these different optimal ratios. Therefore, there must be something that uh, determines these differences in optimal ratios. Uh, and he says, these are large costs of adjustment. These costs should be able to explain the high variance in in real world debt ratios. It could also explain why firms take these long and winding excursions away from their target debt rate ratios. All right. So moving on, uh, another big part uh, we've already sort of played around with the idea, but another big part of uh, of the static trade off theory is. Uh, Let's go more in depth into these debt and taxes. So, uh, let's uh, let's start with uh, Modigliani Miller. Modigliani Miller uh, basically uh, said that interest tax shields were so valuable uh, that 
uh, a firm could basically borrow as much as possible because you'd be shielding yourself uh, to the point where you'd be maximizing your firm value. Uh, obviously, this is a rather extreme implication and it is an incorrect implication. So Miller reworked their proposition, I think 10 years later after received uh, a lot of criticism. So what Miller tried to try to do uh, was saying that uh, in equilibrium, the aggregate supply and demand for debt uh, in which personal income taxes paid by the investor uh, in debt uh, just offset the corporate savings. That meant that debt policy should not matter for any single taxpaying firm since Miller's theory only determines aggregates. It was not about a single firm, it was about aggregates. And then um, Modigliani Miller's theory uh, sort of uh, is a little more justified, but uh, Miller sort of set himself aside. The problem persists, however, uh, in that as you see also from the graph, the net tax gain uh, to corporate borrowing here on the right side of the screen. Um, there, these are all the same theory with different starting points. These are linear, linear versions with different intercepts. There is basically no change. The aforementioned uh, theories tell different stories about aggregate supply and demand for debt, but they make the same prediction about which firms are going to borrow more and which firms are going to bo uh, borrow less. This, this is not exactly the case in real life. Um, and so uh, this is the problem two, brings us to problem two. Uh, unequal cases are treated equally. Uh, the proposition which Myers offers, on the other hand, uh, is in including costs of financial distress. So on the right side of the of the balance of the of the uh, scale. So uh, now we've already included these bankruptcies costs, which which we've talked about uh, before, uh, and but there could also be some sort of administrative costs, agency costs, moral hazards, monitoring and contracting costs, which erode the value uh, even if default. So even when a firm goes bankrupt, uh, sorry, when a firm fails to pay back on a debt, even when default is avoided, these, these are existing costs which must be accounted for. So there's no satisfactory explanation for real debt financing behavior without considering these costs of financial distress. So two statements could be made uh, from this, that risky firms ought to borrow less ceteris paribus. All things considered, that's what ceteris paribus means. Uh, everything else, all things considered, all things held constant. Um, <clears throat> Now, the costs of financial distress are caused by threats or actual uh, default. So uh, safer firms are going to be able to borrow more. That's the bottom line. That's why risky firms ought to borrow less. On the other hand, firms with tangible assets uh, will borrow less than firms holding specialized intangible assets or only growth opportunities. Uh, the costs of financial distress here are caused by the value lost if trouble were to arise. These firms are more likely to lose value in troublesome financial situation, in troublesome financial distress. Hence, they ought to borrow less. To recap, Proposition 2, risky firms borrow less, and firms with intangible specialized assets will also borrow less. Stay tuned for the next video on pecking order theory.